But we will continue with PCA, or start off with PCA in a, in a time jump kind of mode. Um, so I'd like you to open your R studio. You've probably left uh, the project that we've been working on together. So choose File, Recent Projects, REDA, which should reopen the project in its last state, and then pull updates from the repository to continue. And um, <clears throat> then open the file REDA dimension reduction. That's what we'll be working with. Now, I've, I've left the first statement um, here. The goal of principal component analysis is to transform a number of possibly correlated variables into a smaller number of uncorrelated variables called principal components. Um, that's slightly misleading in the sense that, yes, indeed, this is the goal, but that's not actually what PCA does, as you know. So the number of variables and the number of dimensions that you get back from PCA is the same as the number of dimensions that you put in, except that the meaning of the dimensions has changed. So what PCA does in principle is it takes your data cloud in a high dimensional space and it rotates it in that high dimensional space so its projection, its shadow on different other dimensions um, is predictable. So in one dimension, we'd like to have the projection of the highest variability. In the next dimension, we'd like the projection of the second highest variability, and so on. And moreover, we'd like to guarantee that all of these dimensions are not correlated with each other, or they're actually orthogonal to each other. None of the PCA, of the individual PCA dimensions carries information about any of the other. They are now, they are after PCA uncorrelated. And that's useful and important because that usually allows us to reduce the number of dimensions that we want to consider. Why? Well, if there's any kind of linear correlation between dimensions, then the PCA will factor that out. It will put all the variability that is correlated into one dimension, and no significant variability is going to be left in the other one, but just noise. And then we can remove that from analysis. So <clears throat> the first principal component is the projection of the data into a single dimension that has as high a variance as possible, i.e. that it counts for as much of the variability in the data. Now, let's look at a, a simple 2D example to illustrate that. That's something I, I love about R. It, it, it actually allows you to do <coughs> interactive mathematics. So we set a seed and we calculate two sets of normally distributed randomly variates, 500 of each with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. So just a, a, a Gaussian distribution. And um, that's what these look like. So 500 variates in X, 500 variates in Y, it's just a point cloud. It has a mean of zero and it has a standard deviation of one. So this is my, my value x1 and my value y1. And now we'll, we'll generate a, <coughs> a second variable, y2, which will, one half of y2 will be 
built from x1, just 2 times x1. So if we would do only that, we would of course get a single line like this. So this is if y2 is just 2 times x1. And now we will add y1 to that. So this means the x and y are still, you know, in some way uncorrelated, but now y has a strong component of something that is predictable from x. I plot that again. There we go. <clears throat> so now we have a, a point cloud with a strong linear component. Um, it's ex essentially the same random information that I, I put, or uncorrelated information that I put in before, but I've added a correlation. Now, <clears throat> the mean of y2 is, oops, is essentially 0. And the standard deviation of y2 is essentially 2. Well, that's not surprising because I, I multiplied um, um, y2 by y1. And um, I can rescale y2 by subtracting the mean and dividing it by um, y1 and, uh, sorry, and dividing it by the standard deviation. So now I've rescaled y2. It looks exactly the same. I've just compressed it a little bit and I've shifted it on the axis and as a result I now have a standard deviation of 1 and a mean of 0, of course. Okay. <clears throat> so Let's look at these two distributions. So this is a histogram of our um, x1, and this is our histogram of y2. The um, a distribution which has um, which looks like a normal distribution, of course, because it was selected in that way, and the histogram of y2, which as a histogram looks exactly the same as y1 because what we see here is essentially the random component. What we don't see is that all of the values of y2 are actually correlated with y1, with x1. So there's a correlation component, but we don't see that in the distribution itself. If we look at the variable just um, on its own, we don't see any, any of these correlations. Now, indeed, most of the variance is, is explainable here, this, and so in a sense, um, a single dimension calculates uh, would be sufficient to actually um, explain most of what's happening in this data here. So this is what we can find out with uh, PCA. So we use per comp run a PCA. <clears throat> we get two dimensions back. Um, we see that the standard deviation of the first dimension is 1.35. The standard deviation of the second dimension is only uh, 3.2, so it's only 20% of the first dimension. So now, if we would only consider the first rotated principal um, component, then I would, um, I would consider just in one dimension 80% of the variability, and, and, and I, could, I could remove the rest. So all of that which is unique now has, has been mapped to this, to this projection here. So um, <clears throat> now this is, this is the, the rotated version. This is what what uh, PCA has done with the data. So basically it took the point cloud, which we saw in the, in the lower right plot, it figured out where the dimension of the highest variability is, and it rotated that to 
project directly on the x-axis. Right, so the dimensions are just x and y. I've called them x and y because, you know, I've, I've taken a distribution. Um, I could have called them, um, I don't know, age and blood pressure, sure. right? And then plotted them on, on the x and y axis. And so the, when you ran PRCOM, it found the correlation between those two values, the correlation between those two variables and collapsed it into one dimension? Mm -hmm. okay. okay, so, so once again, um, This is the original plot of x1 against y2. This is the plot of the first principal component against the second principal component. So that's the relationship. So essentially you can, oh let me put the two together into one plot. Um, I set up my plotting window with two rows and one column so I can have two scatter plots there. I plot the original principal component like this was that original <coughs> plot. And now I plot the PCA. So you notice that that's exactly fundamentally basically the same plot. It's just this point cloud has been rotated. So it's been rotated that instead of looking at, at it from this direction, we're putting this on the x-axis. And the result of that is that almost all variability is on the x-axis and very little variability is in the y-axis here. The PRC com comes from a package that we need to install it or it comes from what with R? Um, PR comp as well as the other um, principal component thing, PR and comp are in base R. Okay. So just PR comp. Um, as you will would realize when you type it in your installation without having loaded a package, it will just work. Okay. Whenever you need to load a package, that's hopefully, unless I forgot, going to be somewhere in the scripts. Okay. But then it's not going to work for anybody, and everybody is going to put up red post-its, and uh, we'll have to fix that. <clears throat> okay, so, so once again, that's important to realize. What, what principal component analysis actually does, in, in basically, is just rotate high-dimensional data sets in a way um, that the variability of the data sets is presented in an ordered fashion. Now, the one thing about this, so mathematically it's rigorous, it's fast, and it's, it's, it's extremely useful. Uh, one thing about it is um, you can't actually usually interpret what these dimensions are. Because in principle, every dimension here can have a little bit of the information about any of the, uh, of the other components here. So once I plot along the, the first principal component on, on the x-axis, my new x-axis has information from the original x and the original y-axis. So if I, if I said um, that this was age and this was blood pressure, 
um, after I do the principal component analysis, um, this dimension has some information from age and a little bit about blood pressure. And, and it's, you know, I, I can't really label it in any other way except that this is a PC, a principal component. And that's especially, you know, annoying if I do scatter plots. Because usually all these scatter plots then are useful for is um, to see if there's structure in the data, to find if there are areas um, of the projection of the principal components where things come close together and are far apart from other parts of the data set. But I can't immediately identify that. So for example, um, <coughs> if, I, if I would be clustering age and, and, and um, if I would be looking at age and blood pressure here, um, I might see that there are, if, if, if I find um, structure in the principal components, I can't immediately say that these are people with high blood pressure or with um, that people that are very young as, as subpopulations. Um, yeah, I think we'll revisit that point when we look at uh, TSNI um, as an alternative. Um, right, so basically we, we transformed these two histograms here through the principal component analysis. Now if we look at the histogram of um, PCA sample, um, the values are very, very large and very well distributed. If I look at the histogram of the PCA sample, the second dimension or the second principal component, um, then <clears throat> the amount of information that is still left in that histogram is very much, um, very much less. <coughs> so that is then what allows us dimension reduction. We can make a choice about the principal components that we continue considering. Now, <clears throat> um, ARM and basically has two different algorithms for cal calculating principal components. One is peer comp and one is print comp. Um, Fundamentally, they do the same thing, but they use different mathematical approaches. But they use different names for the elements of their result list. So if, you, if you've been working with PR comp, um, and then you, somebody shows you code that works with print comp, you just have to be aware of the fact that these two equivalent algorithms have different element names in their lists. So, things that are called rotations in peer comp are called loadings in print comp. And the actual values, the, the rotated values, are on the list element x of peer comp, but they're scores in print comp. So data dollar $x give you the rotated results of a peer comp call, like we've done here. Uh, data dollar scores would give you the results, the same results from print comp. One thing to note about um, principal components analysis is that it's sensitive to scaling because it gives you the dimension of the highest variability. So if I, again, have age and, and, and um, blood pressure, <clears throat> and I, I get some variability along a plot of age in years and blood pressure in um, millimeters of mercury pressure, or Pascal, if you're using modern skills. Um, that's one thing. But then if I use the age in days, the numbers are very much higher. And then all the variability will be in the age in days, because they're numerically very much larger. And the principal component analysis won't really do anything, but it will just use that as its first principal component. So what you usually do to, to uh, put that into account is to rescale the data. There's a, there's an um, command scale in R.
and that centers and scales the columns of a numeric matrix. So, um, this goes on. Why does it actually tell me that it centers the zone zero and uses a standard deviation of one? Okay, so our help texts are a bit special. Anyway, mm -hmm. so um, scale takes a matrix, two-dimensional ob uh, data object, goes through all the columns, and for each column, <coughs> it um, changes the data to have a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one, so that they're all numerically comparable. Um, that's something you could easily compute, by the way, right? So it's just taking a vector, subtracting mean of the vector, and then dividing the result by standard deviation of the vector. So if you don't remember that, that R has, has a scaling function, um, you, can, you can simply write your own function, right? So this is just x minus mean of x. divided by standard deviation of x. And since all these operations are vectorized, you will get this in one expression. OK. So one really interesting example of PCA analysis is um, basically the only prepackaged um, R data set that I use in my teaching. Um, but this one is really nice. Uh, there's um, a package called MAS, which most of you might already have preloaded. So try library uh, MAS if, if you don't already have it. Um, you need install.packages MAS in the normal way. And um, once you've installed library mass, uh, you can get the you can get prepackaged data sets that come with it, and one of them is called crabs. So, so uh, if you call data crabs, then um, the crabs data will be loaded. So these are morphometric measurements of um, crabs. So, so some people uh, choose their research topics much more smartly than, than we usually do. These people chose to study crabs in the beautiful clear waters off Fremantle in Australia. So they got to go scuba diving and collect crabs. Um, I, I think that can't be beat. Um, and they collected the two different species of crabs, uh, blue and orange um, uh, crabs, and two, uh, I can't uh, remember, uh, two sexes or two genders. Uh, probably, probably it's sex, right? <laughs> With crabs, it's usually the same thing. <laughs> OK, anyway, so they collected males and females. And um, did took calipers, were careful not to be pinched while they were measuring um, um, the frontal lobe size, the rear width, the carapace length, the carapace width, and the body depth. So you do some morphometric measurements. And um, after you're done, you probably put the crab into a nice boiling pot of water and um, study it some more. Um, I should do oyster studies. Oyster studies. Um, <laughs> anyway, so um, <clears throat> let's let's take this um, um yeah, let's, let's annotate these crabs. So we have letters of, uh, let's start here. Let's start with um, 
str crabs. Okay, so species and sex are factors. They have two levels. One is B and O for blue and orange. Uh, the other is F and M for male and female. There's a column of the index, which is, which is just the number. And then there are five columns, numeric columns of the individual uh, measurements. So <clears throat> in order to annotate them, um, we can um, paste the values of column one and the column two together um, using a separator of a dot. So we have BM and BF and OM and OF for blues and oranges, etc. cetera. And um, <clears throat> then um, basically um, this can give us index numbers to identify them. So we have two different varying columns with two different um, <clears throat> with uh, two different columns, with two different states each, but we can combine these two to give us four different states and so that we can distinguish the four different um, types of crabs which we have in our analysis. So if we plot all of these data against these are other, so this is plotting the crabs data, data um, column four, up to column eight, so five columns, four, five, six, seven, eight, against four, five, six, seven, eight. We can see immediately in this trellis plot the individual correlations. So this is the correlation of um, uh, frontal lobe with rear width. Uh, this is the correlation of rear width with carapace width. There's a uh, correlation here which is apparently very strong of uh, carapace length with carapace width and so on. So very high correlations. But if the challenge is now um, to distinguish the blues and the reds and the oranges and the females uh, from uh, the morphometric measurements, or you could paraphrase this the other way around and say, do these different types of crabs have different body shapes, distinctly different body shapes, uh, then it's, it's actually quite difficult because there's a lot of overlap. Um, So <clears throat> you see that we have different plotting symbols here. These, these are plotting characters 1, 2, 3, and 4, which correspond to these factors which we've combined here, B, F, B, M, O, F, and O, and O, M. So as you can see, there, there seems to be some separation here. I, I, I think in this dimension, you know, the males tend to be or the triangles, I don't even know what the triangles are. The triangles seem, uh, tend to be higher up and the circles tend to be lower down, but there's regions where this really totally overlaps. And I, I could not possibly, just taking the measurements in any of these two dimensions, actually distinguish the, the types from each other. So there's something there, but it's, it's not obvious from just looking at the pairwise correlations. So if there's overlap like that, um, maybe principal component analysis can help. Maybe principal component analysis will show us this data in a way um, where we can start distinguishing them. So this is your task now. Apply PCA to the CRABS data set to distinguish species and sex from morphometric measurements. Plot the results of important PCs as a scatter plot in which blue males are shown as blue triangles Orange males as orange triangles, blue females as blue circles, and orange females as orange circles. And if you're done and everybody else is still um, sweating over the task, you can think of how to scale the plot symbols with the mean of all individual measurements. 
Um, so this is a little mini project. So what do we do um, when we have a task like that? Break it down into individual steps. So what, how do we go about doing this? What are the steps? What would you do at home? <laughs> Go to sleep and take a nap. <laughs> I like the way you're thinking. <laughs> On the morning of the fourth day of the workshop, I really do. Scale the data first? Maybe? Mm, well, Why not? I didn't even think of that, but yes. According to what I've just said, that's a good good thing to do, good thing to start. Subsetting? Hmm? Subsetting? Subsetting. What would subsetting do? It would extract the different groups, right, but then our principal component analysis would not be able to, you know, find things that compare and contrast the groups with each other. So here, in, in this case, um, <clears throat> um, you actually need to keep the data together. So scaling it is, looks, looks like a good idea. Um, I'm really curious because actually I must I, I, I've never actually done this. Um, scaling it. So this is of course the same thing, five against six. Looks very similar, right? So what's different? Well, the only thing that's different actually is the axis. So this goes from 15 to 45, and this goes from 6 to 20, right? Now after we scale it, this goes from minus 2 to 2, and this goes from minus 2 to 2. So we're not scaling for us. We're scaling for principal component analysis. For us, this looks exactly the same, except for the different axes. Principal, for com principal component analysis, this is very different, because principal component analysis sees this here in a different way. Um, you have to think of it as something like So if we put them on the same numeric scale, um, so the x limits go from 0 to 50 and the y limits go from 0 to 50, then the principal component analysis will say, well, this one, crap 6, is a lot more important than that one. There's more variability in that. 
right? Do you, do you see the difference? So now they're on the same scale, but projection of into dimension six seems to be very much more important than projection into dimension two. Whereas if we put them on the same scale, minus two to two, minus two to two, two, two essentially, um, then um, the dimensions look equally important. So this is, this is the effect of scaling. Good, good point, thanks for, for raising that. Okay, scaling as a first step is a good idea. But then, apply the PCA. Apply the PCA. Assign the result of PCA to some variable. And then what? Plot. Plot what? PCA, PCA 1 versus PCA 2. Uh, I mean, you can do it in higher dimensions, but it won't be. Is that, is that the first thing you do with PCA? Is that the first thing you did yesterday with PCA? What was the first thing? I know that. You know. What was the first thing you did with your PCA? Look at the variances. Look at the variances, right. So, Inspect the PCs, you look at the relative importance, you maybe give that some thought um, whether there's anything there that, that could be uh, interpreted about the PCs. And then you decide on uh, useful principal components to plot on. or choose several and just plot them all pairwise against each other and then see if your data then becomes interpretable, whether you can see structure in the data that you can, for example, use to, to classify. But for the plotting, I wanted you to plot in a particular way. So you should write your own plotting functions. Essentially, a plotting function that takes as input some of the PCA dollar $x um, column 1, some of the dollar $x column 2, or column 3, or column 4 as x and y values of the plot, and some information that allows the plot to plot circles and triangles and color them blue and orange, depending on um, what types the crabs are that you find. So you need to somehow identify what the types are. Um, as a hint, the parameter PCH, or plotting character, can be used to select filled circles and triangles. <clears throat> and as usual, the parameter call um, can be used to identify orange and, and, and to make orange and blue colors. So what you do to use PCH and to use call, you plot this not as a single variable, but you give it a vector of colors, where each of the colors corresponds to you know, whether the input 
data X and data Y is supposed to be orange or green. So if you, uh, orange or blue. So if you have two X and Y points to plot and the first one is going to be orange and the second one is going to be blue, your color vector is going to say orange, blue. Um, if the first one is a male and the second one is a female, then your PCH vector is going to say in whatever the number is, but essentially triangle circle. If you have five of these, you have five circle, circle, triangle, circle, triangle, something like that. So the length of the vector of PCH and call for color should be the same as the number of rows or the number of data points that you're plotting. And then, for every single data point, you will get the appropriate color or, or variable. It, right. If you want to scale this, the same thing goes for CEX. If you give it a vector of values for CEX or character expansion, you can get small and large values um, <clears throat> for every single data point. You can probably put all of this into one plot command, but you can also just plot an empty frame of the correct size, you know, by just plotting everything and specifying equals n. So this will just set up the frame and not, not actually plot any points. And then, point, then plotting things individually with the points function. So the points function works exactly like the plot function, except it doesn't create a frame, but it plots into the last frame that was plotted. And uh, it then operates over individual points that you, can, that you can put in. So what I often do, for example, if I want to label points, um, is I plot a whole cloud of points with plot, and then I use the points function to plot over, overwrite, um, <coughs> say, three or five of them that I want to emphasize uh, with a red dot. So. You can either do this in plot, or you can use um, an empty frame, plotting just an empty frame, and then using points, just as a hint. Or come up with different ways. That's just how I would do it. All clear, well specified. Is the specification missing something? Yes, interpret your data. What, what is the interpretation at the end that we're looking for? The interpretation is the, the question, can we clearly identify the crab types from these five different morphometric measurements?
later on. I don't know. I'm on scaling right now. So. <laughs> I mean, I guess you could do it without scaling.
just running a scale PC. Maybe 
I think most of you have made excellent progress along the way, and um, I, I think we can basically go through these principles quickly before we even break for coffee. So, what were we trying to do? So the first step that we had decided on is to scale the data. And that's very simply done. Um, Krabs S is simply scale I want the rest too. So at first I, I assign um, I just copy my data frame over. So now Crabs S is the same data frame as Crabs, and then Crabs S is columns five to eight is Crabs five to eight. Scaled. Okay, so I take the scaled values of columns 5 to 8, which are the, the numeric columns. Um, columns 1 to 4 have the annotations, and I overwrite that in my, my Crabs S. And um, It's four to eight? Yeah. 
Thank you. So, the structure is exactly the same. We have our annotations of species and sex and the, the uh, row index, um, but the actual values are now different because they're now scaled. So this is the original box plot, and, and the numeric values are indeed um, on a somewhat different scale. <clears throat> and the box plot of the transformed version, of course, is looks like that. So that's the effect of scaling. Next thing we wanted to do is to um, assign the results of the PCA to some variable and run the PCA. What do I type? PR comp um, crabs S428, I believe. So we have values along five different components and different things here. So um, let's see what we have. Plot PCA. OK. What is this? What does that plot show us? What's on the x-axis? Categories. Right, so the x-axis, this is a bar plot of the different categories, the different principal components. Um, on the left, the first principal component, and then so on. What's on the y-axis? Each principal component, <coughs> or the contribution to the variance? Of exactly, the contribution to the variance of each principal component. So you can see that um, most of the variance is in the first principal component. Almost all of the variances in the first principle component. There's so much information in there. So why weren't we able to, to when we looked at our plots, why was it Im impossible to basically, well, simply take the first principle component and be done with it? So if we rethink what we're seeing here, what this really says is that regardless of what we're looking at, what measurement we're looking at, if frontal lobe is small, um, then if frontal lobe is small, rear width is also going to be small, and carapace length is going to be small, and carapace width is going to be small, and body depth is going to be small. <laughs> and if frontal lobe is large, then all of these measurements are also going to be large. What does that mean? There's something we weren't considering here. Which is that all of our points, like our different measurements, are actually related, correlated? They're all correlated with each other in the same way. 
Why would that be? Because they scale as they grow in roughly the same way. Exactly, they scale as they grow in roughly the same way. So we have small crabs and large crabs. And small crabs have small frontal lobe and rear width and carapace length and widths and depths. And large crabs have large of all of that. And that's what we see in our data. What we have here is a confounding factor that influences all of the variables in a similar way. Not in exactly the same way, in a similar way. And the differences, uh, the relative differences between <coughs> these frontal lobes and, and, and carapace widths and so on, that's where the information actually is. It's not in the absolute values, it's in the relative values. And that's obscured because if we plot the data like that, all we see is that everything is highly correlated. So in this case, the highest variance is in the first principal component. But that doesn't mean that that is the one that is the most important in interpreting our data set. It is the one that we remove. And then we will find, once we remove that, we're probably going to be much happier and much more able to distinguish what we're actually looking for. Uh, Jennifer, you had a question? Um, I was just wondering if if that meant that if you reordered the components, would you still get the same principal component? If you re, if I reorder my measurements or the yes. principal components, well, that uh, so reordering the principal components doesn't make sense because they're yeah. always ordered in the way where the PC one has the highest variance, mm -hmm. and right. if I reorder my my. If, if I simply um, permute the columns of my measurements, I would still get exactly the same principal components. So the order of the measurements is not important. And the order of the principal components is always designed, is uh, uh, determined by the height of the variance. Right, but if, okay, so if you, but if you remove PR1, Yep. then more of the variance gets assigned to other components? No, I'm not removing it. Okay. I'm just saying when I interpret my data, I can leave PR1 aside because it, it basically factors out something that is common apparently to all my variables and it's just, you know, it's important but it's not what I'm, what I'm looking for here. So usually when you think of, of PCA as dimension reduction, you have a reflex of saying, okay, we take the first five principal components, we throw away everything else. But in this case, we actually take the first two, this, the second and the third principal component, we throw away the first one, and we also throw away the, 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 the last one as well. So it's not always that you always do the same thing, you just take the highest principal components. Right. It depends on what these principal components signify. And in this case, they identify a confounding factor. So how do you, what are the parameters for deciding which one you do? You look at it and make an informed decision. I don't think that there's a good uh, principled way of deciding um, how many of the principal components you use. It's an exploratory method. I mean, you can't really technically interpret these principal components in the first place. So, so what you do is um, you look at them, you try to, to understand what's going on here, and then you check whether using any of them in any combination is helpful to answer the question that you originally have to your data. I, I've been looking. I haven't found a package that has a method to choose principal components. I don't know if you're aware of any. I, it, your aims are different when you do yeah. principal components analysis, like for different things too. Like yesterday, we were kind of looking for patches, like across our cancers or homogeneity across them. Like today, we're seeing if you can like identify something that's like a summary of the data that will separate these uh, crabs. So. I think that's the other problem. It's just like you go into it with different aims, and then in like genetics, you go in with like the aim of um, I want to control for uh, population fragmentation, and so then you just take them and you use them as controls in the model. So you're just doing different things. Okay, I want to take the first PC, like that's the only one that's important. But 
we already know what that is, right? So. Well, after thinking about what we're seeing here and, and, yeah, and exactly. basically our yeah, nose being pushed into the data this way. For like big differences or if you're more interested in smaller? Exactly. And what those differences are. Like, do they represent something that you don't know about, like a batch that you're not aware of? Or do they represent like something we're completely aware of? Right. So, um, if we plot component two against component three, we see a lot of structure, a lot of um, clustering that wasn't apparent before. So we have we have a cluster here and a cluster here, a cluster here and a cluster there. Now, do any of these clusters actually correspond to? blue males and orange females, I have no idea. Just looking at that plot, we could not possibly tell because the principal components themselves have information from all of them at the same time. So after the coffee break, what we're going to do is to find a way to color and to put in shapes and other identifiers. And this is a really, really important addition to your exploratory data analysis toolkit. You'll do a lot of scatter plots, but they become meaningful when you can label them in some way. Okay? And we'll do that after the coffee break. Um, we'll reconvene at 11.